my name is Josh Fulbert. I'm a faculty member here at the School of Education at Indiana University East. I'd like to welcome you to our program this evening. Um, just as a quick overview of our schedule, we'll be beginning with a faculty panel uh, in which we will be discussing specifically the major themes in the Push Out documentary based on the work of Dr. Monique W. Morris. Uh, Dr. Morris herself will be joining us at six o'clock for uh, a live presentation as well. Uh, and really our goal with the panel is to sort of expand on her work as well as to hopefully model some reflective discussion about some of the major ideas there. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by several very insightful faculty members from Indiana Universities this evening. Um, and I invite them to introduce themselves now. Hi, everybody. My name is Laverne Nishihara, and I'm an associate professor of English at IU East. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Cal Simpson. I'm the senior lecturer of marketing and management uh, at IU East. Hey, everyone. I am Dr. Beth Tramel. I am a licensed psychologist and the director of the Master's in Mental Health Counseling Program here at IU East. And I am Dr. Stephanie Whitehead. I am Associate Professor of Criminal Justice here at IU East. Thank you all. And thank you again for uh, volunteering your time to be on our panel this evening. Just to establish some common ground for everybody because we, we have made the Push Out documentary available uh, through IU East for anybody who wants to view that. Uh, if you've already had a chance to review the film, hopefully this will be a little bit of a refresher to kind of build into Dr. Morris's presentation. If you haven't yet had the opportunity to view the film, this will give a running start and hopefully help orient you to the discussion in the subsequent talk. And please be assured that you can, uh, you can still view the film at, at a later date if you'd like to do that. We would hopefully encourage you to do so. So uh, as a, a little bit of an overview of Push Out and some of the major ideas contained within it, um, Perhaps the most powerful aspect of the film is that it portrays the lived experiences of Black girls as they address how school-based practices have created distinct challenges, but also have contributed to a profound sense of self. Uh, one of the themes that the documentary specifically highlights is the relevance of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and how childhood trauma among Black girls is related often to adultification and criminalization. So to get into a little bit of the terminology, Adultification generally refers to uh, the idea that Black girls are often perceived as being older, more sexually mature than they really are. And this naturally can impact how adults in schools react to or perceive uh, Black girls. And this transfers into other social institutions as well. Criminalization has more to do with really framing particular behaviors or defining particular behaviors broadly as crimes. This can also relate to the idea of uh, taking groups of people or activities related to groups of people and criminalizing or defining, framing those as crimes as well. Um, this can be particularly relevant in schools. And I have to pause to mention that there is an intersection here of adultification and criminalization that is notable, uh, where the behaviors of Black girls specifically may be interpreted more as antisocial, malicious, um, and therefore somehow warranting a more punitive response, rather than perhaps being perceived as typical youth behavior uh, or even a way to communicate distress. So another important aspect of push out is that it illustrates how school officials, principals, teachers, educators in general can find new paths that concentrate on the reasons behind certain behaviors rather than just reactively punishing uh, behaviors that are seen as antisocial. Importantly, push out also provides examples of schools and other organizations that are making a difference in the lives of black girls uh, examples would be the African American Female Experience in Oakland, uh, the Columbus City Preparatory School for Girls in Columbus, Ohio, the National Crittenden in Portland, Oregon, Soul Sisters Leadership Collective in Miami, Florida, and Emerge in California. Uh, all of these in, uh, schools and other community organizations discuss alternatives to suspensions and expulsions, implementing more community based or culturally responsive uh, methods. Along with this, the film then profiles teachers, mentors, judges, and principals who are recognizing and confronting the pervasive overpunishment of Black girls and finding new ways of working with Black girls to emphasize their inherent value and dignity. So that, that, is, the, that is the capsule to bring you up to speed on Push Out. Um, to, to begin our, our faculty panel discussion, I think it's important to note that um, and we've talked a lot about how to how to approach this. And an important idea that came up was the notion of cultural humility. 
especially because notably none of us really on the panel currently have lived the experience of being a black girl ourselves. Uh, so that seemed like a really important note to begin with. And I'd like to uh, turn it over to Laverne Ishihara to say more about that. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Um, I'm going to comment a little bit about push out <clears throat> from this perspective of narrative medicine, the whole idea that healing can begin with telling stories. Um, I see in my notes, the sentence, there are wonderful stories as told by individual girls and young women in Monique Morris's documentary, Push Out. And I thought, they're not wonderful experiences. They're experiences of trauma, uh, largely originating from schools. I think what I meant was that the girls did a wonderful job with relating their stories, the interviewers and producers. Um, did a marvelous job with getting their stories to, pre to be presented in the film. But the stories deal with real trauma, uh, usually connected with stigmas associated with being Black girls. Now, I did love that early in the documentary, there's a statement that schools should be sites of healing. And I thought that would be a wonderful thing for schools to be sites of healing. But in narrative medicine, and it can be medicine for physical ailments as well as emotional ones, there's the idea that healing can start with individuals telling their stories and being listened to carefully and deeply. And uh, looking at my notes, I see the impression made on me by the first um, example of a girl um, named Samaya, now 12 years old but she was just seven years old when she was targeted by a teacher at her new school who punished her for the slightest misbehavior. And it's things like, well, standing up, maybe talking, but finally when she was kept inside during recess and ignored, she actually left the school and wandered around the streets by herself uh, for two hours and there was an upsetting moment there where um, it was pointed out where exactly she was contemplating suicide, like throwing herself off from a height. Then fortunately, she did make her way back to the school. Um, you know, in the aftermath, Samaya's parents placed her in another school and she went through years of therapy, now fortunately feeling better. Uh, and there are wonderful programs being described in the documentary. But to proceed, um, you know, when I agreed to be on this panel, I thought the only way I could do it was to um, just allow that I'm no expert in any way um, with the topic of this documentary. And the only way I can comment on a very memorable documentary push out and also the girls' stories is from the stances of cultural humility and also a narrative humility. Cultural competence, um, I gather and I agree is an outmoded idea, cultural competence, because it presumes that anybody can know enough about a culture to claim competence about the culture. Uh, when I think about it, I probably cannot claim cultural competence from any of the cultures that I came from even much less from a culture uh, you know, outside of my own uh, experiences. So now the definition of cultural humility is mine, but I came to cultural hu humility and the concept of it from the field of narrative medicine. But here's my definition of cultural humility. Cultural humility is an attitude that I will try to listen and learn and start to understand, but I really will not be able to acquire a complete understanding of a culture. You know, I'll never have a complete understanding, but I can try to listen, learn, start to understand. Uh, I think introspection is very important in this. I have to know myself to the best of my ability, know my limits, and also try to become better at truly listening 
and learning and uh, allowing that maybe I can start uh, to understand a little bit and just keep trying that way. But a lot of it is um, being quiet, observing and listening. Um, I'll branch off from cultural humility to narrative humility. And I think the one person who coined the term narrative humility is someone I have studied who's a physician writer named Sayantani Dasgupta. She's a doctor who also has a background in English. Um, she's of South Asian descent. But um, her concept of narrative humility, and this is my take on it, is this attitude that I will try to listen and learn from another's stories, but I will never have a complete understanding of that individual either. So we're going from the culture to the individual. Uh, an individual is highly complex. An individual, when telling a story, may be sharing some, but not all. Uh, my own listening might be flawed as well. And I need to acknowledge um, my understanding will always be partial and flawed as well. And for me, this narrative humility is part of acknowledging that a kind of privacy and mystery in each person, that each person is complicated. Each person has a private um, self that is not necessarily shared, certainly not with me, maybe not with many people. And this acknowledging that um, I can't have a complete understanding of the individual, though I can listen as hard as I can and ask questions if allowed. It's part of acknowledging the dignity of that individual, that you're complex. I can try to understand, but I acknowledge um, the mystery of you, that there are parts of you that are unfathomable. So, I thought again, since I'm so far from being an expert in anything in this documentary, which I learned a lot from, and I hope to view it multiple times after this, if the link will stay you know, functional, that I could only comment from the stances of cultural humility and narrative humility, and from the stance of somebody who's trying to learn, especially from the stories. And I so admire the programs and the schools that are um, described and shown in the documentary for all the good that they are doing. So those are um, what the things that I wanted to start out with. I think it's such a brilliant way to start, uh, you know, this conversation, uh, especially for us. And and as we are gearing up to hear from Dr. Morris, which I know we're all really excited to hear from her about. And, you know, for me as a psychologist, I do a lot of narrative work and we sort of expect folks to come in and tell their stories. And, um, you know, I, I often talk with students that I'm training to say, you know, the, the beauty of what we get to do is we get to hear people's stories and it gives us a broader perspective of, of how people experience the world. And I really feel like that is at the heart of the beauty of this documentary is that, if we can approach it with cultural humility, right? As Laverne, you, you so beautifully shared that if we can step into it with this, I don't know what it's like to live this way, but these stories give me a glimpse. And if I can listen, instead of allowing my biases to say, oh, well, that's not true, or that, that couldn't possibly be happening in my backyard, allow it to sort of sink in with that cultural humility that we can, we can approach this with. Um, I just love that you shared that. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, I, I love your definition, by the way. And also too, um, when you think about these things, you can, you kind of think about, you mentioned the stories, right? You mentioned, you hear so many stories. Unfortunately, uh, I've heard these stories before. They're not new. Uh, they're long-standing stories. Um, unfortunately, you, know, you have a lot of individuals who really don't listen to them because you hear so many of them and you hear them over and over and, and over again. Uh, maybe some of our officials, maybe some of those are in higher-ups. Uh, it, it goes on deaf ears uh, because you hear it so many times. 
and, and as you said, Beth, as you said, I can't imagine this going on in my backyard. I can imagine it going on for blocks uh, from, from where I grew up and what I've seen. Um, uh, this is highly unfortunate, but I am happy to hear that people are getting their stories out and people are more willing to understand and look internally to try to get out of their comfort zone and see what's really going on and get to the root of these issues and these problems. Because one thing we have to understand is understanding our own emotional IQ and to be able to, uh, to be able to um, not always sympathize, but empathize, you know, what's going on uh, in, in those communities and things like that. So thank, I, I really uh, do thank you for that definition. I love it. I think it's also important to, you know, you brought up emotional IQ that I think part of it is folks don't, it's uncomfortable to think about someone else's lived experience being that way. Right. And I think that sometimes what happens to folks were like, well, that I, I'm, I'm like defending, you know, myself against having to feel what other people might be feeling. And I actually really appreciated the very beginning right. of the documentary because it kind of came out with some pretty strong images that I think evoke some pretty strong emotions in people. And I think that's the point. I think that's what Dr. Morris is trying to get us to realize is that we almost have to be moved emotionally and face that emotion and sit in the discomfort of it, right? Isn't that what we have to do to, to really hear the stories and listen well? Yeah, you're right. I, I think, I also think you mentioned comfortability. Sometimes we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And, and that's, that's how we truly learn is just have that uncomfortable feeling and don't let it go away. Don't push it to the side, really address it and take the time to really let it, let it absorb so that we can feel this and then we can move and progress forward. Cal, you'd be a great psychologist. <laughs> That's what I talk about in therapy all the time, right? I mean, everybody wants to just skip over it, right? It's like, right. oh, I'm starting to feel anxious or I'm starting to feel bad in the therapy room. And then it's like, no, actually the healing comes when we allow ourselves to kind of sit in it and, and experience it and reflect it and not just fix it. And mm -hmm. in fact, that's what a lot of... Um, that's what a lot of us white folks want to do. We want to just step right into fix it and save it mode. And really it's, we have to, we have to really step into that cultural humility and, and, and say, Hey, I, I don't understand. And I'm, I'm, I may not be the right person to fix this. You know, I'll say one last thing. And you jump, <laughs> jump in and save. We're not looking for a savior. Mm. We're not looking for a savior. We're looking for somebody who understands and want to understand and want to listen. We can save ourselves. Just give us time. We can do that. And and allow allow the stories to be heard and uh -huh. then be an ally where we can uh -huh. when it's time for us to do that. I mean, yeah. Sorry, Laverne, you look like you had something you were going to say. Oh. Uh, I'll stop my chat um, in the chat box. This is a different type of being uncomfortable, but I've always, I've always thought with the effort for racial, cultural, and other integration, um, if we want to have an integrated society or a diverse society, um, it is necessary to tolerate the feeling of being uncomfortable, that if you feel uh, different from those around you, being uncomfortable is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, sometimes I've wanted to say that when um, maybe white students or others are saying, uh, well, I went to a mostly African-American event because I wanted the extra credits or whatever. I felt uncomfortable. And um, my response is uncomfortable can be a good thing. It means you are learning. If you're comfortable, if it's accustomed, how is that learning if you already know it? So yeah, it's a toleration for feeling uncomfortable and uh, that can be stressful, but it's also the only way you can learn too. So thank you for uh, you know, bringing up and talking about uh, discomfort. Yeah, I appreciate that as well because you know one of the things I wanted to talk about um, when I get to it in a few minutes, 
is this idea of disorder and how we have become such a society that is so scared to death of anything out of the norm that those feelings of discomfort are seen as abnormal instead of something normalized and something that we must deal with. So I think it fits in with that whole whole narrative of, of order within our society. Let's just go there, Stephanie. <laughs> I mean, we might as well go there. <laughs> we might as well go there. <laughs> okay, we can go there. Um, this is, being in criminal justice, I never get touchy-feely subjects. I never get to talk about, you know, the power of healing, the power of narrative. Like, I don't get to talk about this fun and invigorating stuff. Every, you should just come I, hang out with us, Stephanie. Just yeah, I know. I need to. Yeah. Um, everything I get to deal with is like the murky underbelly of society. And that includes issues of power and, and control. And as I watched the documentary, I was kind of taken with this, this whole idea of healing, which is really a prominent theme within it. But I couldn't help but be reminded of how we got to this point of control of our children, this need to keep everything ordered and to keep them under control. And there are a couple of things I'd like to speak about as they relate to the documentary. The first is what David Garland has referred to as the culture of control. In his work, Garland outlines the long history and continued increase in punitive policies in not only the criminal justice system, but all institutions in modern society, including the educational system. He traces the movement of broken windows policing and zero tolerance policies and how they have shifted the landscape of how we deal with those viewed as disordered and deviant. Zero tolerance policies have taken hold not only in the criminal justice landscape, but in the educational system as well. These policies have maneuvered into the belief that we should have no tolerance for anything deemed outside the norm, including the behaviors of children in public and private spaces. Spaces that, as the documentary points out, should be safe spaces for exploration and healing have instead become spaces of control and order. This shift to a culture of control in schools coincided with several events in the 90s. There were several high profile events, most notably the vampire murders and the, Col and the Columbine shootings, whereby the myth of the juvenile super predator was born. These horrific events were taken as proof that children were no longer purely innocent, but capable of unspeakable acts that should be dealt with in the most punitive manner. Schools suddenly began to take on the look of prisons with metal detectors, police on site, showing a full criminalization of youth. As mentioned in the documentary, this criminalization has moved beyond what is typically criminal behavior. The increased use of status offenses, once held as the follies of youth, have become behaviors that are deemed so outside the norm that they must be dealt with in punitive manners. This includes behaviors such as congregating together in public spaces, which can be seen as a sign of, of um, gang-like behavior, as is clothing, music, fighting, and other brash behaviors all of which has added to an increased control on youth and youthful behaviors in schools. Hopefully documentaries such as this will show the dangers in bringing the culture of control into the educational realm. While it only seems to increase, the programs discussed do offer hope of ways to manage problems in a way that is healing to kids. Woof. So I, I got to be a little optimistic at the end. <laughs> Hey, so I just have an initial reaction to, um, you know, everything you're saying, I mean, causes my blood to boil. If I'm being super honest, it just, it like infuriates me, but I know that there are folks out there that are, you know, maybe they're in the school building and they're thinking, how do I not have control? Right. I mean, I think that word is really tricky to think about in terms of how do we you know, get the kids to do what we need them to do if we don't have control. So I know that this word control is something that I've heard you talk about before, Stephanie. And yeah, I just don't know if you 
if you have thoughts on that too, or Laverne, I know you kind of came off your mic too, but. I'll let Laverne jump in. Um, I like that Beth is bringing up the conflict between needing um, some order so that learning can occur versus being very punitive yeah. and unfairly punitive. Um, as somebody who's leading meetings or trying to teach a class, I do consider myself quite controlling, but I hope that I'm not guilty of the type of punitive behavior that was so traumatic um, in, in this film. So um, it's really tricky. And um, that was a thought provoking um, brief talk that Stephanie just gave. You know, are, are, are we trying to control, when you use the word controlling, are we trying to control without understanding? Uh, because there's a lot of other elements that go on behind the scenes that may cause this quote unquote deviant behavior, as we may say. Uh, there can be, as they mentioned in, in, in the uh, video, uh, you know, a lot of other responsibilities that's also being placed on their shoulders that could also have an effect being laid and things of that nature. Uh, so let's not under, let's, let's not forget about those things. It's not it's not in your face. It's not in the forefront. So what are we really trying to control without having some semblance of understanding what's going on? No, I think you all bring up really good points about this notion of control and what it actually what it actually means. Um, I think there's a difference between talking about a culture of control versus a locus of control, you know, that's going on in everyday behavior. I think those are two completely separate entities. And what he's talking about is this wider desire that we have to almost treat kids like adults at this point and expect the same type of control, the same type of self-control that, that we might expect at another level. So I think it's, it's more that kind of difference than it is talking about this personal type of control. I think you also brought up a great point, Stephanie, that it's, it's, it's as much about control as it is about how we are defining out of control, right? I mean, that was what you were also saying is like this difference between deviant behavior and how are we seeing something as deviant and needing to be controlled if we're going to continue to use that sort of um, word. And so I think that's also at the heart of what we're, we're trying to illuminate by, by sharing this documentary. I know that's probably Dr. Morris's um, goal here too, is to say, hey, uh, you know, we are, we are criminalizing. I mean, that's exactly what we're saying. We're criminalizing behaviors that otherwise may be, may be considered very typical. As a quick general note, I'd like to just jump in and say too, and I, I think this has been a thread throughout a lot of the discussion that's happened so far, but um, I, it really kind of came to me with, I think, what Stephanie was talking about regarding just kind of the maybe not being quite as warm, fuzzy piece of things. I, I think it's really important that we're grappling with the complexity in an authentic way, whether it's watching the documentary, whether it's having this discussion, reading Dr. Morris's work. That's one of the strongest things that really comes through to me about the work is that it isn't it isn't just about the, you know, kind of skipping over the hard work and getting to the feel good part of like, you know, a feeling or even fixing it if you want to frame it that way. It is also really grappling with, with some of the larger systemic challenges with some, some really ugly stuff, honestly, that you just can't extract from this larger experience. I think even getting back to sort of where, uh, where Laverne started us out, the, uh, the, the portrayals, the the lived experiences of the girls in the documentary, I think are by far one of the most powerful parts. And that was something that really came through too, where it's like, there is, there's, there's really a blend of some things that are very, very eye-opening, very empowering. Uh, I think very even affirming, even in the face of adversity that these girls are experiencing, but then you also can't easily separate that from some, some very large social and systemic problems and some very genuine 
challenges or even outright traumas. And I think it's, I think the, we have a responsibility really to grapple with all of that in its full complexity. And I think Josh, not just grapple with it once. I mean, I think we have to go back and watch it again. And it's, it may be painful and uncomfortable to watch, but you know, we have some comments in the, in the box that, that talk about how disequilibrium is, is our way of, of learning. And so I actually love Laverne, you mentioned that at the beginning that you were going to go back and watch it again. And I think that that is, I think that is going to be the power because we have to continue to have these experiences where we're, we're seeing things differently and we're understanding the world through the lens of somebody else. And it's not just, Oh, I've done this. And now I'm, I'm good. I can just move on. I, I understand their experiences now. Cal, you're laughing. <laughs> Cal, you're laughing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you see that a lot. You, you, you jump in and you say, Hey, I, I did my good deed for the day. And then I move on. You know, but you keep forgetting that these people still live in this area. They are still going through these experiences. They are still uh, having this, this trauma put upon them, even to become long-term uh, and things of that nature. Uh, just jumping in and out is not going to fix it. You have to really start getting your hands dirty, as we talked about before, that feeling of uncomfortability. Yeah. And wanting to go back to the discomfort goes against what we, what we typically want to do, right? Or we tend to want to always stay at equilibrium. We want to stay at what is easy. And so, you know, I, I think whether it's watching this uh, documentary a few times, it's, it's, you know, watching other, um, other resources that are out there reading more materials. And, and for me, I think it's also expanding your circle of friends. So I often try to challenge folks to get out of their comfort zone in real life, you know, take a look at, at your, your friend group, take a look at the people you spend time looking on social media. How different are they from you? Um, because I don't think we grow if we're around all stuck people our, that stuck are just in our like same us. circle, kind of stuck in our same circle. Right. Yeah, you know, you know, take pride in having that diverse circle. Take pride in learning from those experiences. You know, uh, I think it just helps fuel information, helps us grow. And I think then we take that information, then we uh, pass it along. And that's how we break that cycle. That's how we break that chain, you know, allowing us to grow and wanting to grow, you know, wanting to understand that feeling of being uncomfortable, that feeling of, looking for more information, that feeling of, um, you know, uh, getting off the couch and doing something, you know, I, I think that makes that real change. And I actually think it's also, you know, I, I talk with a lot of folks and they think about kind of big uh, systemic problems, right? Like this, they think, what can just little old me do about this, this big, huge problem, right? And, you know, if, if we're being honest, you know, I'm sure there's lots of folks who have been thinking that way. And, and frankly, I, I don't know, but maybe even Dr. Morris had felt that way before she uh, started doing any of the work that she has now put out. And the thing that I talk with folks about is think about your circle of influence, right? Who are the people you talk to regularly? For us, it might be our students. It might be our colleagues. It's the people we work with and we go to church with and we're around. And you have to think about that being your, your, your wake, right? I do this activity when I do workshops and I think, think about the wake that you can create, the ripples that you can create when you have conversations like this. Hey, I watched this documentary. It was so powerful. I want you to watch it with me and I want to talk to you about it. If we're not having those conversations, that's where we don't see the ripple of our wake. We have to start having these conversations with people in real ways so we can start to take little old me to little old me and my circle of friends and then their circle of friends. And so I just thought that that came to mind too, as we were kind of talking about, about this. Uh, may I bring up the age group that's dealt with in the documentary? Um, another way that I'm no expert is children. 
except uh, for having been a child decades and decades ago, I would say that uh, I know zero about children. Um, I do deal with young adults, you know, as a university teacher. Um, and as I was watching um, Dr. Morris's documentary and thinking about, you know, my admiration for the people in the programs who've had such a big impact and realizing, well, that is beyond me. And part of it is <clears throat> not working with children or really knowing children. But I thought as far as my little corner of the world and what I can do, that effort to try to listen, you know, try to question um, my students, for example, try to listen to somebody who appears to be um, acting up. Well, I teach first year composition, okay, so I, I see a lot of acting up. Yeah, I, I'm sort of used to that. Uh, and I must say the effort to uh, listen to, um, I have to repeat, there are wonderful stories in the film. It, it can uh, be kind of wearing too, to listen hard, uh, to make the time. Um, and time is neutral. We have choices about how we spend our time. And so some of the time needs to be to um, give people more opportunities to speak and um, listen deeply. But I will say that the whole um, narrative, humility, et cetera, that takes a whole lot of doing, a whole lot of effort and energy as well. So it is not an easy thing at all. Uh, and again, I wanna express my admiration for the programs and the people who are working with the girls and one of the girls towards the end got hired by what sounds like a wonderful program um, because that is a hard thing to do. I, I think we're walking right up to perhaps one of the most important, but also one of the most difficult questions that naturally emerges from uh, from the push out documentary from perhaps Dr. Morris's larger body of work. And, the, you know, we've, I, I think, started to discuss a little bit here. And it really becomes a question of what do we do next? Where do we go from here? Um, I, I don't really expect anybody to have a definitive answer to that question, obviously. But particularly as we're getting closer to transitioning into uh, Dr. Morris's talk, um, would anyone like to offer any thoughts on perhaps what else we can do with this with this information and how we can how we can continue this this process of growth that you've all spoken to? Um, I will say just have a deeper understanding. Yes, yes, definitely, yes. <laughs> I agree. Go I ahead, agree. <laughs> no, I agree. Go ahead. I totally agree. Respect. Yes, I agree. Go ahead. Go ahead. So from my perspective, it has to be structural change, not necessarily personal change, which we're talking a lot about here. Um, there has to be structural issues that we have to deal with. Racism as a whole, not this personal thing, but the structural aspects of racism have to be dealt with. Sexism has to be dealt with. Um, poverty has to be dealt with. In all of these situations, there's such structural change that has to happen before we can even start to tackle those personal changes. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And racism has been going on for so long. I mean, uh, you know, systemic barriers have been put in place and et cetera. Um, and it's not always overt. And I think that's the, the issue we have to really start looking at is racism is not always overt. It's these small things that happen in these schools. It's these small things that happen in these communities. It's a small thing that happen uh, that, that creates these giant clusters of issues and problems. I, I think we need to start tackling it little by little uh, in smaller sections and then gradually work our way out. Because come on guys, racism is not gonna be fixed after this you know, uh, conversation. 
uh, it's a long standing issue and it's something that deserves the proper that deserves really strong and proper attention. Yeah, I think it's it's both a um, you know systemic uh, thing that we've got to work on um, at our our local levels. If we have influence at our local levels, look into your um, community. Who is um, the face of your community? Who is leading your community? And uh, what decisions are being made in your schools at the school board level? And I also think it does have to be at a personal level. You know, I think it does start with becoming aware of biases that we carry, and it takes a lot of time to dig into those biases that we we carry and play out in those small ways that Cal, you're you're talking about. Um, you you may not intend for it to be coming out that way, and yet it does, and it's hurtful, and it is yours to own. And I'm speaking. Um, for myself as well, I, I have to spend a lot of time uh, reflecting on my on my own biases in all sorts of ways. So I think it is both, um, and we all have a part to play. And I believe that may be a fitting thought with which to start wrapping up our panel discussion. I first off have to say that I, I cannot honestly think of a, a more truly mindful way to explore a topic of this complexity than by uh, having the kind of thoughtful and spirited discussion that our panelists have been kind enough to engage in this evening. So I hope that that has been as genuinely compelling to everyone watching as, uh, as I know it has been for us. Um, as we start to switch gears and before introducing our speaker for this evening, Please allow me to extend my deepest gratitude to, again, the members of our faculty panel, not only for their contributions tonight, but for their work uh, up to the state planning and supporting this event. I would also like to extend my deepest gratitude to the sponsors of tonight's event at Indiana University East, the School of Education, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, the School of Business and Economics, uh, and <clears throat> the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Of course, uh, we are supported by the generosity of Mindful Explorations, courtesy of the William H. and Gene R. Reller Endowment. Uh, the widespread support, I have to say, for this event from across campus, from all of, all of, the, uh, all of the schools, the, gener uh, the Mindful Explorations uh, that I mentioned, it, it has really just been overwhelming and uplifting in uh, some times that I think we could agree have been challenging to see the kind of positivity and the kind of support for programming like this that we have seen. So I really cannot overstate my appreciation for uh, the positivity, the generosity that, that has allowed this experience not only to take place, but to be freely and openly available to the public. So I thank everyone involved in this process sincerely for everything they've done. Um, our speaker tonight, Dr. Monique W. Morris is an award-winning author and social justice scholar with three decades of expertise or sorry, experience, well, she has a lot of expertise, in the areas of education, civil rights, uh, juvenile and criminal justice. Dr. Morris is the president and CEO of Grantmakers for Girls of Color, a philanthropic coll collaborative that supports a world in which all girls and young women of color are healthy, safe, thriving, and fully empowered to dream and shape their desired reality on their terms, while dismantling structural barriers created by racism, sexism, ageism, and other forms of oppression, that prevent their full participation in our country's future. In May of 2020, she launched the Love is Healing Fund, which has generated nearly $3 million to more than 140 organizations nationwide. And in September of 2020, she co-founded the Black Girl Freedom Fund as part of the One Billion Black Girls, or sorry, One Billion for Black Girls campaign, uh, calling for a $1 billion investment in Black girls over the next 10 years. Dr. Morris is a 2012 Soros Justice Fellow, the former vice president for economic programs, advocacy and research for the NAACP, and the former director of research for the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at the UC Berkeley Law School. She has also worked in partnership with and served as a consultant for federal, state, and, and county agencies, national academic and research institutions, and communities throughout the nation to develop, uh, to develop research, comprehensive approaches and training curricula to eliminate racial and ethnic and gender disparities, in justice and educational systems. Dr. Morris is also an executive producer and co-writer of the Push Out documentary, um, which is 
based on two of her books, Singer Rhythm, Dance of Blues, and Push Out the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools. What perhaps comes through most clearly in Dr. Morris's scholarship, philanthropy, and her direct interaction with students, as evidenced in doc the documentary itself, is a profound empathy that informs and inspires. Dr. Morris is adept at both describing social experiences unique to Black girls and at working for their empowerment and for larger systemic improvements. It is a tremendous honor to have her speaking with us this evening. And on behalf of Indiana University East, I would like to welcome Dr. Monique W. Morris. Thank you so much uh, for that. I'm so happy that I had an opportunity to listen in on the tail end of the faculty discussion. Um, and it sounds like it was a pretty robust discussion. So uh, thank you for uh, laying the foundations for what I uh, will offer you this evening. Um, thank you first uh, for the opportunity to be in community with you this evening. I am uh, really grateful that the conversation is moving from primarily focusing on the harmful conditions impacting Black girls' achievement in schools and beyond to including an intentional focus on the conditions that need to be in place for the liberated futures. Um, as president and CEO of Grant Makers for Girls of Color, it's been my honor to work closely with my team to mobilize and distribute resources that support these liberated futures. Uh, in just under two years, um, we are now uh, at more than 5 million uh, working in partnership uh, with 180 organizations in 36 states, Guam and Puerto Rico, organizations that are doing critical work to center the well being and empowerment of girls and femmes of color. Uh, we just celebrated the one year anniversary of the Black Girl Freedom Fund, a signature fund that's associated with the call uh, for a billion dollar investment in Black girls and femmes over the next 10 years. Um, the community moving resources to support Black girls is growing, and that's good news. My work now and for the past several years has really been a project to locate and elevate Black girls in the public consciousness, to reduce the erasure that has been fertile ground for exploitation and harm, and to ensure accountability among systems that are charged to nurture and protect them so that they can grow into healthy adults. Um, you know, I think back at times uh, about when we first started this conversation and when I first wrote Push Out, uh, the criminalization of Black girls in schools, there was not yet a robust national community of support around Black girls. Some of us were holding space for our girls, um, all while recognizing that because Black girls often experience harm behind closed doors rather than out in public, people assumed the harm wasn't there. But that's not true. We knew then, and we know now, that neglect is a form of violence. So while they were rarely mentioned in conversations about exclusionary discipline, ignored in national discourses about safety, protection, and well-being, and were an afterthought in philanthropy and other pow powerful uh, circles of influencers um, and decision makers, we needed to build a village of support that could counter this form of structural violence and perceived disposability. We now have more spaces exploring Black girls' well being, but there's still so much we could be doing to uplift specific actions, decisions, and understandings to address what I've called the school to confinement pathways or the policies, practices, conditions, and prevailing consciousness that facilitate risk of future contact with the juvenile court or criminal legal systems. Black girls are overrepresented across the spectrum of discipline in schools at every educational level. Just prior to the pandemic, a study by one of our grantee partners, the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality, found that Black girls are twice as likely than their white counterparts to experience restraint and five times more likely uh, to receive a, a mechanical restraint, um, approximately four times more likely than white girls to face suspension and expulsion, and are 5.3 times more likely to be transferred to an alternative school for disciplinary reasons. It's also worth noting that across the spectrum of discipline, Black girls continue to experience a greater racial disparity than their male counterparts. For example, Black boys are nearly 2.6 times more likely than white boys to experience suspension, while Black girls are four times more likely than white girls to experience suspension. Black boys are just under two and a half times more likely than white boys to be arrested on campus, while black girls are 3.6 times more likely than white girls to experience the same. 
My work and that of others have found that these disparities are a function of intersecting structures and conditions of harm that make Black girls uniquely vulnerable. That's why we did the documentary and have written all of these books and uh, have developed a series um, really for educators and others who are seeking to explore this work um, to more deeply understand all of the contributing factors associated with the school to confinement pathways for black girls, but also really looking at how complex this actually is. One of the reasons I have not used the term and what I think is helpful as we seek to engage in discussions about remedy to this, I have not used the linear framework of school to prison pipeline because I want to invite all of us into an expansion of our lens such that we can actually see our girls and then respond accordingly. Among the uh, structures and conditions of harm, though, that we have mapped are age compression or adultification. Um, the reading of, of girls as more adult-like than they actually are, or as adults when they are not. Um, and this has led to the belief that Black girls are in need of less protection, less comfort, and less nurturing. Um, it's associated with more punitive responses to Black girls when they get in trouble. A failure to recognize trauma as a critical disruptor in the lives and learning conditions of children and adolescents. In The Deepest Well, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris wrote about students living with significant adverse childhood experiences, and she wrote that they are nearly 33 times more likely to be diagnosed with a learning or behavioral problem. I add that the historical trauma of Black students is also triggered by patterns of erasure, exploitation, and violence present in pedagogical practices and curricula. Trauma affects stress levels which affect the brain and the body. Children and adolescents who are not supported in their healing journey are prone to routine dysregulation. The misogynoir that leads to misreadings of black girlhood um, expressions and um, that lead them to be regarded as loud, sassy, combative, or willfully defiant um, when they may simply be expressions of joy, dissent, or a recognition of unfairness or injustice is also a problem. Reliance on zero tolerance and other instruments of surveillance to produce a so-called or perception of safety. Increases in school-based law enforcement, metal detectors, physical searches, et cetera, exacerbate the feeling that schools are prisons rather than sanctuaries that students ask for. And structural and policy um, language and enforcement that place a unique burden on Black girls um, given their orientation toward codes of conduct that punish or criminalize normal adolescent behaviors or culturally affirming hairstyles are also part of the problem. Research from some of G4GC's other grantee partners confirmed that the COVID-19 pandemic only exacerbated the harmful conditions that lead to criminalization and other forms of harm among Black girls and other girls of color. Across the nation, we saw the pandemic produce a deepening of the adultification and sometimes parentification being experienced by Black girls, in addition to their elevated risk of harm from sexual and physical violence, toxic stress, and mental illness. For example, a new study by A Long Walk Home, which provides uh, or works with Black girls in, in the Chicago area, found that 72% of of their girls knew a family, friend, coworker, or neighbor who had been diagnosed with COVID-19. 59% had reported that COVID created a financial hardship. 55% uh, reported increased violence in their neighborhood. 45% reported having to take care of siblings. 59% reported depression and 69% reported anxiety. 80% were worried about their education and 24% personally knew Black girls who were experiencing domestic or sexual violence during the pandemic. But here's what we know. I said this in my TED talk a few years ago. Um, I wrote it in Singer Rhythm Dance of Blues, uh, Education for the Liberation of Black and Brown Girls. And I'll say it again because it's still true. With intention, we can address this. Some of the strategies that effectively support Black girls in schools and beyond include the implementation of a robust continuum of alternatives to exclusionary discipline, such as restorative approaches, 
New research by Georgetown examining restorative approaches and girls of color specifically found that school-based restorative approaches produce benefits across a spectrum of categories, including but not limited to school connectedness, peer relationships, a sense of safety, and a positive school climate, and social emotional literacy skills, among other areas that lead to less risky behavior, fewer harassment incidents, greater academic achievement, and improved teacher well being. When you take suspension off the table, it allows for a much deeper understanding of what is leading to some of these conditions of dysregulation in the first place. Implementation and guidance on self uh, on student self regulation. Um, tools such as mindful awareness, breathing exercises, and yoga to help students when they're dysregulated are key. The students who are considered most disruptive are often the same ones who are experiencing significant disruption. I'll say that again. Students who are considered disruptive are the ones experiencing disruption. When we shift our orientation and understanding to more appropriately respond to that, that's when we'll start to make shifts in how we respond to young people in crisis. How we teach and model self-regulation, which our young people are capable of when we invest in those tools, it matters. We have to develop the capacity of schools and other organizations working with Black girls to counter adultification, which prevents appropriate responses to childhood trauma and recognize Black girls for the girls that they are. Um, when I was, uh, Working in the Bay Area, I helped to launch a program, a, a reentry program for girls who had experienced school pushout. And one of the exercises that we had was for them to read the Georgetown study on adultification. So we asked the classroom to actually go through the exercise of reading the study, talking through what the primary um, findings were from the study. And what stuck with me was not that they you know, were unfamiliar with the concept. They were very familiar with the concept of adultification. What stayed with me though, was um, the comment of one of the girls in the class who said, well, we might be more independent, which is one of the ways that adultification manifests is adults believing that black girls are more independent than their white counterparts and are believed to know more about adult subject matter. But she asked, you, or she said, you need to ask why we're more independent. And they're asking us not to just be content with the statistics or be content with the findings, but to do a little more digging and to build those relationships that allow for us to more deeply understand what's producing these conditions of harm and how we uh, mitigate that harm. We have to replace school police with school counselors, clinicians, and nurses who are trained to uh, engage modalities that are both gender responsive and culturally competent. Um, I write in Sing a Rhythm, Dance a Blues that, um, you know, our safety in schools do not require a police escort. We have to engage the ways of safety and understandings about safety um, that are really old understandings um, and not informed by the past 20 years of us really relying on law enforcement to respond to social conditions in our schools. Um, law enforcement will use the tools they have the tools that are needed to engage in the actual facilitation of safety are a different set of tools. And um, you know, I'm, if we have time in the q and I'd love to unpack that a little bit, but I think it's really important when we're thinking about building out an ecosystem or building out a structure that can support um, the liberated futures of Black girls to deeply examine how we have have created systems and structures that replicate one of the most harmful institutions in our society, the carceral system, brought that into spaces of learning and then wonder why our children don't feel safe. We have to use art-based modalities to enhance healing and learning. Um, I give several examples of how to do this. Um, it's a, a really um, important piece of engaging in culturally responsive practices to engage the arts. Arts are central. They're, they're, they're often treated as elective, but they're part of how we know. When we extend epistemology, when we deepen our understanding of how we reach people, how they understand, you know, how they, how they begin to unpack and study and learn not just what they know, but, you know, how they know what they know, um, Art is an important part of that. 
visual art, musical art, literary art, all of this is important. It's not secondary. Um, it's, and it's also deeply rooted in some of the healing practices that can help young people feel safe. We also need to know that we are not the saviors of black girls. Um, when I first started to offer that, um, it was met with some resistance because people see young people in harm and they think we must save them. And I'm asking you know, us to rethink our language around the savior mentality. We have to know that we are not the saviors of black girls, but rather their village of care, their community. Counter the tendency to engage strategies and language that reek of a savior complex in the curriculum, in responses to their trauma and elsewhere. Instead, we need to develop our or develop their capacity to draw out with resources and support the wisdoms they're developing um, about their own lived experiences. One of the most important things that we can do is recognize that Black girls are experts in their own experience. And so there is no way that we can develop remedy to the conditions impacting them without them at the center, without them informing the process. And so for that reason, I have, uh, you know, we, we've been supporting through grant makers for girls of color and my work has largely centered participatory processes for a deeper understanding and engagement of those at the center of our inquiry, those at the center of our discussion. Having a conversation about black girls without black girls is meaningless. Developing systems and structures that impact black girls without including black girls will be harmful. Um, I elevate other techniques in singer rhythm, dance of blues um, and in other publicly available content. But what I wanna emphasize tonight um, is that we must build relationships with black girls. Um, that is how we practice our most culturally competent expression of building toward empowerment. And when we think about you know, how we build these relationships. One of the things that I offer in Push Out that I hope it becomes evident in the documentary film um, and that we try to practice and definitely see practiced among our community of grantee partners at G4GC is that we spend less time engaging in respectability politics and really try to hone in on what girls need to better understand how they feel respected as human beings. Our policies, our practices, our way of framing how we come to know Black girlhood is largely framed in a context of respectability politics. Are they cursing? What clothes are they wearing? Are their bodies too provocative for school or learning? Um, are they loud or are they being disruptive because they laugh really loudly? These are things that you know, you know, really speak to how society has structured an understanding of what girlhood is supposed to be. And if we don't fall in line with that, we're you know, deemed problematic. But we have to challenge that because the bodies of black girls are not problematic. We are problematizing them. We are creating the problem. We are, um, I think, moving toward uh, shifts in that when we talk through the development of alternatives. And when I say the development of a robust continuum of alternatives, what I'm talking about are certainly restorative approaches, the mindfulness, meditation, et cetera, self-regulation tools that I was talking about, but also the way that we construct some of our own understandings about who's eligible to participate in these alternatives. So there have been districts across the country that I've witnessed where the girls are, or there's a structure in place that allows for there to be some diversion, some community service, some opportunity for self-regulation, some discussion groups, some artwork or maker corners, all, the, all these ways that young people are invited to think about um, how they might repair. And then when I ask who is participating in the program and are black girls present in those programs, I see the numbers start to dwindle. And so we have to ask ourselves what it is that is leading so many of our learning spaces to count black girls out of those who are deemed eligible for participation in some of these alternatives. That is why this work has been about locating black girls. That's why I've been intentional with our growing community 
in saying we have to name black girls among the girls who are impacted by these conditions because when we don't name them, they do get lost. When we don't name them, they are rendered vulnerable to society's ideas about who they are, rather than bringing them into the center so that we can better understand how to make sure they're eligible for these alternatives, how to make sure these alternatives are speaking to the needs and have the right facilitation in order to be effective with this body of people. Because at the end of the day, this conversation about empowerment is moot if we feel that Black girls are disposable. For the past, I would say, at least six years now, um, you know, I, and certainly at the very beginning of the conversation around push out, um, I was inviting whole communities to come in to conversation with me, and I would ask them to say that Black girls are sacred and loved. And I use it, if you follow me on social media, you'll see that I still continue to use that as a hashtag, Black girls are sacred and loved. I write it in books. I talk about it on, in, in every way possible. We close the film with the idea that Black girls are sacred and loved because what we are countering, the hardest thing for us to address is the prevailing consciousness that renders Black girls as disposable. They are not. Black girls are not disposable. I don't care if she curses. I don't care if she's loud. I don't care if she fights. What she is demonstrating for us is her dysregulation, and then we have to address what is leading to that disruption so that we can bring her back into community, because that is what our goal is, is to build out a full community, not to temporarily remove kids who are in crisis. And I start with Black girls and engage Black girls because, again, they are disproportionately overrepresented across the spectrum of discipline at every educational level, and the racial disparities are great among girls. And so when we think about girls, when we think about what they need, when we think about Black girls and their unique ability to um, you know, be a part of various communities at any given time, to be you know, content creators, to be you know, uh, those who give so much of, of this society their popular language, that we also honor them as scholars, we honor them as thinkers, we honor them as those who are learning and capable of being in our communities in very meaningful ways, and most importantly, capable of healing in the face of tremendous, sometimes compounded trauma. So before I close this portion, because I really want to leave as much time as possible for there to be some Q&A and discussion um, and response to some of the questions that might be forming in the chat. Um, you know, I want to share that I believe that empowerment is not something that can be instilled into someone else. Um, I cannot empower you. That framework often obscures our own unique abilities to honor the agency and wisdoms of Black girls. Um, you know, that they have on their own. Um, you know, Black girls have been among the most consistent champions for justice in this nation. They are grand articulators of democracy and are on the front lines of social movements because they're uniquely positioned to understand the failures of existing systems. But uh, they can do more than tell us what's wrong. They can do more than be the canaries in the coal mine. They can also see a version of society that's possible if we sharpen their lens and believe in them. We all benefit from that. Reciprocity is important, but how we benefit shouldn't be the motivation here. We increase the capacity of Black girls to be empowered by recognizing their full humanity, dismantling the systems and structures that undermine their well being, and invest robustly in their vision for the future. Societies, yes, but most importantly, their own. Thank you for this chance to share these opening uh, remarks and um, I look forward to uh, being in conversation. Dr. Morris, thank you so much, first of all. Um, I, I know that uh, we're looking for some questions to come in through the chat. Uh, I was wondering if we could circle back to something that you touched on uh, specifically, I think kind of the tools for law enforcement, uh, specifically and how that might take shape or how that might contrast from education. Uh, would you be willing to say more about that? 
Yes, um, and I will say that I am um, approaching this from a radical Black women's uh, framework, <laughs> and uh, specifically the teachings of Audre Lorde, um, who invited us to interrogate you know, this idea of the master's tools um, and what it produces. So um, I led a study with uh, Rebecca Epstein at the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality when I was at the National Black Women's Justice Institute. And we looked at school resource officers and girls of color, um, looking specifically at how they were interacting with girls across the country, particularly in the Southern region of the US, um, what some of their understandings were about girlhood um, as it, it, it manifests among communities of color and how they were approaching um, this group of young people who um, were growing in terms of their content, contact with them um, in, this, in a critical moment. Um, and what we found, um, I think probably one of the more significant findings from the study was that not only were the uh, sort of manifestations of law enforcement arbitrary across the country. So, um, you know, depending on where you were in any given jurisdiction, how law enforcement shows up in the school could vary. Um, sometimes it was school resource officers. Sometimes it was the local police department. Sometimes they had their own police department. Sometimes it was, uh, you know, state troopers coming in. It was just very arbitrary. Not every state required a um, MOU or some kind of understanding between the school. When we talked to the officers who were working in schools and had regular contact with girls, they all uh, acknowledged that they had not received training or discussion about working with girls of color, had not received robust training on uh, working with young people who were survivors of sexual violence, had not had um, any real um, long-term engagement around how to respond um, to those who are living at the intersections of uh, multiple conditions of harm. Um, and, um, you know, what was most um, exciting for me was that many of the law enforcement officers who participated in the study also acknowledged that they were most effective when they were not leaning on their badge. In other words, when they felt that they were um, leading with being a resource for young people and building relationships with girls, that's when they could step into positions of being uh, caregivers almost and supporters, which told me and told them they didn't necessarily need to be law enforcement agents <laughs> to be, or officers to be in the school to have that kind of relationship. They needed to be strong youth development workers, that what young people needed was not necessarily someone who could arrest them, um, but they needed someone who could build relationships that could prevent harm uh, from taking shape in their lives. And so, um, you know, I think there, we've reached a point where so many of us cannot imagine school districts without law enforcement, cannot imagine that safety is something that cannot be implemented by those who are patrolling and uh, so surveilling the campus. And yet, uh, when we do a deeper dive and have conversations with girls of color about what they consider to be safe, law enforcement is usually not a part of the equation, but rather the uh, strengthened relationships that they have with adults that can lead them to feel a sense of emotional safety and, uh, and, and desire to be in a loving uh, learning environment. Um, the officers, um, you know, I write about this a little bit in Singer Rhythm Dance of Blues because I think for so many of us, um, we've become um, clear <laughs> or we've become conditioned, I would say, to uh, see metal detectors and security cameras and law enforcement officers now as a normal part of the uh, school and learning environment without consideration for how their presence might be triggering for the students of color who experience different um, ways of, of engaging with these populations and with some of these systems um, and, and uh, instruments. And so what I'm offering when I say that, um, you know, the tools that law enforcement have available to them are largely about suppression and violence. Um, about intimidation and power. And if we are engaged in a conversation with young people about how to recognize their own power, um, how to increase their capacity to be empowered, then we have to deeply understand and challenge ourselves to consider how we 
um, engage them in the development of uh, other modalities that can facilitate safety beyond a badge and a gun. Those are different tools, right? The tools of suppression and surveillance are the tools that create in learning institutions that young people describe as prisons. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when I talk to young people and ask them about their school environment and their learning experience and they don't say it feels like a prison. I'm looking forward to the day when I talk to girls about what they need to feel safe and they don't say, you know, that um, they, they, you know, feel like their, their personal property is being surveilled and they have to hide uh, their, you know, feminine hygiene projects, uh, pro uh, products because they're embarrassed. Um, by the men who are going through their bags in the name of safety. Um, I look forward to the day when um, girls' bodies are not <laughs> surveilled and examined um, upon entry to the school as a condition for their learning. Um, those are tools of oppression. Those are tools of fear. And what I'm offering is that um, many other learning institutions that are not public institutions that are largely populated by children of color have a different way of learning, that they are, you know, less time is spent uh, examining what they're wearing and more time is spent pouring into their learning. Um, there is an availability of clinicians and counselors on staff to support their well-being. There are open conversations about respect and safety in the school. There are ways that um, educators are building relationships with young people so that they feel that they can um, really move forward um, with the creation of, of alternatives to some of these spaces. It's one of the reasons, and, and the, I might add, this is not just something that can happen in private school, right? One of the reasons that we um, centered um, explicitly what was happening at the Columbus City Prep School for Girls and the work of uh, Ms. Patton is that this can happen in public schools too. This can happen um, in ways that in, invite us to remember who we're working with and why we entered this profession in the first place. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm scrolling through some comments and questions and I, I see a few that I think might uh, go well together. The first I'd like to convey to you is uh, our resident expert in educational psychology has commented that Piaget called the uncomfortable feeling disequilibrium and said that it was an essential part of learning and that without disequilibrium, there is no learning. I, I suspect that that is relevant to a lot of your work and your philosophy and something that hopefully uh, you, you might appreciate hearing from the comment section. Um, perhaps along similar lines, a question was raised about uh, what kind of pushback potentially you get when you present information or how you go about responding to people who maybe maybe are not quite on board with the information or resistant to understanding or perhaps to that disequilibrium. Yeah, I appreciate you grounding that question in the disequilibrium um, space. You know, a lot of what I'm talking about is um, really about shifting what we think about Black girls. I expected discomfort. Um, I have been living with discomfort <laughs> and um, so the discomfort is not new to me um, and not new to anyone who stands in a space where they are trying to locate and elevate a population that has been perceived of and treated as disposable or um, of lesser importance to some of these grand narratives. How I respond um, to pushback, you know, I, I don't give it much uh, thought uh, in my emotional space. I give it great thought in my intellectual space. Um, thankfully, I have the capacity to, um, I would say, separate and, and try to move in a space where I understand that to dismantle structures of oppression requires us to tackle hard questions and for us to sit with the ways in which we may have been benefiting from these systems and to grieve that process a little bit. Um, to spend some time understanding that many people who are most uncomfortable with what I offer are grieving their, the way that they have benefited from a privilege that possibly was unearned on their part. They're grieving their status that may have been unearned. They're grieving 
their um, ability to walk through life not knowing or claiming they don't know. Um, the way I see it, you know, once I offer that this is a condition that so many of our young people are living with, you can't really pretend you don't know. Um, not, not when you go to sleep at night, right? So, you know, I think it was um, Beth who mentioned prior to my coming on that um, one has to really be focused on their sphere of influence. Um, and for me, that plays out in terms of how we are going to use our power to try to move the conversation a little bit further along. Um, I'm grounded in Martin Luther King's definition of uh, power and or exploration of power, um, offering that power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Um, and, you know, power really has to move in a way that um, tries to undo what stands in the way of love. If we are committed, as I am, uh, to, you know, moving forward with an energy of love, then those who are struggling along the way are not really an impediment to me um, or you know, what I'm trying to elevate. Um, I recognize them for where they might be in their journey of learning. I recognize them for how they might be wrestling with uh, their own um, location in the conversation. Um, but I'm very clear. I'm very clear about what our girls are experiencing, what they have experienced when uh, you know, I can go into communities and experience grandmothers who are thankful that we're now finally having a conversation about push out and the way that black girls are treated in this society um, because they remember years and decades ago when they couldn't or didn't feel that they had the capacity to stand in their truths in this way. I'm, I recognize that this work is much bigger than me. And so because it is so, so much bigger than me, um, I, I feel a sense of comfort in being in community with folks around how we overcome those who are not yet where they need to be. I also am very grateful that the community is growing among those who you know, want to be a part of the conversation, who are um, really you know, excited about how to um, you know, be more responsive around this work. So you know, fewer and fewer people are pushing back and more people are asking the good questions around um, how they can respond and how they can use their sphere of influence to make a difference in this space, um, to ensure that our, our educational systems are more equitable to um, support the groundings and, and development of structures that provide the best opportunity for all of our children. I just want to say I'm so happy that you came, that you're here, and that your response to that was was brilliant. And I was <laughs> over here screaming alongside you. <laughs> Thank you for the work and, and everything you've done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think if I'm if I'm picking up uh, some of the some of the general tenor of the the comments in the chat. Um, what, and we kind of ended the, the, the discussion, I think, earlier on a similar note. There, there is that inevitable question of what we, what we can do as individuals. And specifically, I've got some questions that um, I think I could best pose as uh, first looking at how, how we might, particularly those of us who have not lived the experience of being Black girls or Black women, how we might help um, potentially in the process of identifying phenomena like criminalization or adultification happening to black girls or black women and further um, potentially what we can do to help others recognize some of these phenomena or respond appropriately. So I know there's a lot there, but anything you could do to speak to that would be great. Yeah, I'll just pick up where I left off, I think, um, by saying any and all of us can use our power to correct what stands against love. That becomes a deeper call to action with the more power you have. Um, a lot of times people who are not black girls feel that they have nothing to offer or to say about the experience of being black girls and they don't. Recognize your lane, right? 
work with the black girls around you so that they can articulate what their experiences are. Our role as non-black girls is to say, how can I use my power to create spaces for there to be an undoing of all that is standing in the way of love and standing in the way of equity, standing in the way of you being able to fully heal and immerse yourself in this learning environment or whatever conditions um, or institutions she's finding herself in. I think it is really important for um, all of us to realize that, you know, I said this before, that the participatory ways that we engage Black girls has to be centered so that they can inform what is necessary and important in their lives. And that's not just theory. Um, at Grant Makers for Girls of Color, for example, when we launched the Black Girl Freedom Fund, we also launched a roundtable of young people to be key decision makers in where those resources go. The first round of grantees were picked by Black girls because Black girls knew what they needed to facilitate safety and wellness, and we trusted them. We guided them along the process of how to ask certain questions or how to move forward in this work, but ultimately we trusted the decision-making power and we, just, and we trusted the capacity of Black girls to stand in their truth and to know what is best for them in that moment or to be in conversation um, with us about what kind of things are necessary in their lives. We don't do that enough. Um, too often we're in spaces where we feel we have the answers, we know the policy, we know the language, and we may know the language and the policy, but it certainly should be informed by those who are most impacted by it. So as we are um, you know, thinking about what we can do, we can think about this all in terms of what's manageable in our own sphere of influence and our own decisions that are made each day. But we can also think about it on the macro level around how we are understanding Black girlhood. How are we increasing our own learning to be able to better respond to the conditions of Black girls? Obviously, having conversations like this is a start. Um, doing deeper readings um, is, is helpful. But you know, build some relationships. <laughs> That's the best way, <laughs> is to build relationships and talk to girls, not in um, an exploitative or you know, voyeuristic way, but in a genuine way where you're able to recognize her humanity and connect with her in that, in that very real way. Sometimes it's as basic as not jumping to conclusions when young people are in public spaces and being young and black and female um, you know, in, in, in public spaces. Um, uh, black girls deal with a lot um, uh, from the gaze of others um, on their behaviors and their language and their um, expressions. And so what all of us can do is um, really try to think through how we have either been a part of the tapestry of healing in this conversation or how we have been a part of the tapestry of harm. And if we have been a part of a tapestry of harm, either um, unwillingly, um, unknowingly, undesirably, um, then what can we do to correct that and to use new tools to build relationships, new tools to um, get to a deeper understanding of how we connect with those young people so that when they do experience dysregulation, which is inevitable, um, or when they do make a mistake, which is inevitable, that they feel a sense of safety um, to be able to recover rather than to feel that it's over for them. Thank you again, Dr. Morris. I'd, I'd like to say just personally that working in the field of special education, so much of what you're saying about our behavior really resonates with me, partly because one of the biggest things we do try to teach is not only to understand, well, not only to recognize the behavior that we're seeing and then try to teach positive behavior, but to, to recognize the underlying function or the underlying reason for the way people act the way that they do. Um, and I, I know you've, you've touched on this to some degree already, but um, I, I'm sure that there are people who would be interested in, in any, uh, any practical strategies that you might want to share, or even just anything that you might want to comment on that you've learned in this process of trying to really get a deeper understanding of students and, and the way that they outwardly behave. Well, I have to say that um, <clears throat> when I first wrote Push Out, I was really intent upon making sure that I would get, I would, that the girls who trusted me with their stories would feel that I did them justice, right? That I could communicate hours and hours and hours of focus groups and in-depth interviews um, in a way that could reach people 
such that they understand that these are not just isolated incidents of girls who are experiencing some issues or that I'm telling stories that um, you know, are compelling one way or another, but to understand that um, it was my intention to take this participatory study and build out a narrative that could help us structure something different. Um, you know, spoiler alert, I said at the end of Push Out the book that I hoped that five years from now, I was not still describing the same conditions with a skimpy community <laughs> with limited resources that I hoped that there would be a growing body of literature that addressed this issue, that scholars would come into the, the, this conversation, um, you know, grad students would be engaged, faculty would be trying to deal with it, school districts would be trying to deal with it. Um, and I'm happy to say that I have seen some movement there, but it really wasn't until I wrote Push Out and then we launched the um, program that I was describing earlier, the reentry program for girls who had experienced Push Out, that I had probably the deepest learning that um, to date on this issue, which was really that schools needed to be locations for healing so that they could be locations for learning, particularly for young people who have experienced school as a part of the tapestry of harm in their lives. In Push Out, I talked about um, restorative approaches not only being about repairing harm between individuals, but also understanding how we might begin to repair harm between individuals and institutions. With Sing a Rhythm, Dance of Blues, a lot of the language that emerged from this sort of understanding about our need for healing in order for us to learn and for there to be a relationship between the healing and the learning really came from deep conversations with girls in that program and the observation of how we were moving young people who were um, really you know, not successful in any other alternative learning space in the school district that we were working with. We intentionally, I intentionally went for the girls that were not doing well anywhere else. And when we were speaking to the superintendent and speaking to the various school principals, I was like, I give me the girls that are not doing well in all of your other programs because those are the ones that I wanna know how we can maintain in our community, how we wanna bring them back into our community. And so, you know, people jokingly referred to the program as the No Child Left Behind program because all the ones that weren't successful came to us. And what we did, was figure out with them what they needed to graduate, what they needed to move on to a higher uh, education if that's what they desired, and many of them did desire to do that, and how we how we got there. Um, and these are girls, you know, 80% of the girls to refer to this program were referred by the juvenile court. These were girls who not only had push out experience, but who had been survivors of commercial sex trafficking. Um, you know, again, they were young people who were dealing with compounded forms of trauma. And so what we learned was that when young people are brought into a caring, loving space, and the emphasis is really on their healing, that that's when they trusted us enough to say, okay, now I can learn what it is that you're trying to teach me. Now I can, now that I've built this relationship with you, now that I understand that you care about my well being, now I'm willing to open my brain to you. Now I can feel safe enough to concentrate on how to construct a, a sentence and how to move forward with some of the other, um, you know, academic work that needed to take place in order for them to graduate from high school. And so that was really um, something that informs, you know, much of how I come to approach this work, um, much of how many of our grantee partners at G4GC are recognizing their impact in community is this um, new old language around healing and the centering of healing, not seeing it as secondary. Um, you know, when I first started this conversation, many educators would say, you know, thanks Monique, but I'm not, an, I'm not a healer. Right. Um, I'm, I came here to teach math and it, it was, you know, only a matter of time in this conversation, you know, before they began to understand that you won't be successful in teaching math until you maintain a space that feels like it's a loving healing space for these kids. Otherwise, they don't trust you enough to learn math from you. They don't like you. They're not building connections. And for black girls who are relational, black girls who are living often um, with these um, intersecting structures of oppression, 
um, who are trying to navigate, they have a, a deep resilience and an amazing capacity to perform and to appear as if everything is okay, but they're also at risk of other health conditions because of the way that they've internalized um, what they have to do in order to be successful in these spaces. I recognize that my conversation about the healing before and with learning um, is essential in order for us to begin to tell new stories, not of Black girls and young women who have been successful despite what happened to them in their learning spaces, but because of what happened to them in their learning spaces. So um, that's, that's really been the deepest learning for me, um, one that continues to grow the more I interact with uh, programs across the country um, and uh, experience young people themselves who um, you know, want to be more deeply involved in this conversation, but it's a valuable um, lesson from, from having conversations <laughs> with, with young people and also exploring um, the data that can come from um, having a deeper inquiry around black girls. I can't say enough how much I appreciate the emphasis that you're putting on relationship building, on active listening, just this, this much more personal, much more human process. I know one of the one of the kind of themes or questions that came up early in the panel discussion relevant to schools in particular is that uh, we've we've seen this sort of large scale move in a lot of ways, both in schools and society toward criminalization, toward control. And it feels like there's often a difficulty that people have differentiating between that extreme version and the idea of maintaining some kind of some kind of order or some kind of uh, just basically what we would probably consider classroom management. Have you found that the focus on relationship building is a big part of helping people make that distinction or engage in that process? Are there other pieces to it that you'd like to comment on? Yes, I, you know, I do think that a lot of times people don't see their discipline referrals as participating in, in the criminalization, but rather you know, may see their discipline referrals just as a way to manage uh, a disruptive student in the moment. Um, what I have offered is that young people who, again, um, you know, those who are disruptive are experiencing disruption. And sometimes um, what is the challenge for us in engaging in classroom work is for us to be able to elevate a child's purpose over punishment, right? Understanding who that student is, recognizing what their purpose is, how they've come to understand their purpose, um, is really how we also um, begin to anchor conversations and relationships about um, that that are focused on um, you know their capacity to stand in their truths and to stand in their gifts. Um, the new projects that I'm working on one um, will be out in June that is a um, discussion with educators about um, you know how to create schools that are locations for Black Girl Excellence. Um, and then the second new project is a graphic novel that is about um, what happens when we support Black girls who stand in their gifts. And those two projects, I think, will be the culminating uh, pieces of the series on Push Out for me, at least for a while. Um, but I think you know the emphasis here is really on trying to get us to move past uh, this way that we have come to understand how we teach and how we engage young people. But young people know that school is a place for control, right? They, they, they know this, which is why they're co-constructing it with us every time we step into a classroom with them, um, whether we acknowledge it or not. It's important for us to recognize that you know, young people, if they feel that they're in a tug of war with power, some of them who are, have been the deepest resistors to some of the structures of oppression in their lives will also see school as a part of the tapestry of harm. The only way for us to become part of a tapestry of healing is to repair the relationship, is to have conversations, to know who your students are. Many educators are using tools that I think are extraordinary and innovative in doing that. They're building apps, they're starting you know, classrooms with surveys, um, they're having conversations or scheduling one-on-one um, -on -one lunches with students, and it does take some time. But once you take the time and you know your students, then you're able, when there is a moment of dysregulation, to draw upon that relationship to help them reset. And it can reduce you know, the 
the reliance on exclusionary discipline tremendously. Um, there was a study a few years ago that looked at empathic uh, discipline that found that when a young person has at least one strong relate or has a relationship with at least one adult on campus that she's significantly less likely uh, to be suspended or expelled from school. Just a relationship with one adult. So if every child has an adult on campus that they feel safe with, that automatically reduces the likelihood that they will experience suspension and expulsion. Why? Because they have an adult that they can go to, that they perceive to be an advocate who can help them with their regulation. We demonstrated that in the push out film where one of the girls who was ready to fight because a student had pulled the chair from under her, um, you know, her safe person happened to be the principal. And so she was able to get her on the phone and have the conversation that helped her reset, right? These are the, when we have these relationships in place, we don't have to call in external bodies um, to deepen the harm that a young person is already experiencing. I can't emphasize enough how, it, how important it is to begin to instill some of these practices early on. But just because you didn't start it in August or September doesn't mean you can't introduce it now. It is important to think through how to cultivate a school space that invites young people into um, practicing these tools of self-regulation. Um, I used to say you know, to my grad students that you shouldn't have to be in grad school before someone asks you what you need to be present for the day to learn, right? That there's a relationship that you're building with people that trust you and the information that you're trying to convey that you need to hold as sacred. Um, you know, most educators, I think, get into this work because they love children, because they believe in the promise of education, and through the bureaucracy and the daily grind, sometimes they are human too, they get tired or they get triggered. And so it's also important for educators to take care of themselves so that they can be present in a way that they, that they need to be. They need to be better supported. You know, obviously, I need, you know, teachers to be paid better. All these structures need to be in place. Um, but I also think that it's really important for us to think through how we are having conversations with young people that don't require extra money, that don't require, um, you know, one of the things that we offer in the push out film or pushoutfilm.com space um, are some deeper dives with Stephanie Patton, um, where she's also explaining how she was able to remove some of the administrative tasks for her teachers to provide space and opportunity for them to build relationships with students. So administrators also play a role in helping to bring in other parties or bring in other resources to help um, educators and teachers specifically to be able to take the time they need to build relationships with students rather than engaging in some of the administrative tasks that they have or, or are um, often called to do. Thank you again. We, we've had uh, a comment slash question come through. If you don't mind, I'll read it in its entirety because it, it starts off with a very nice compliment and I wanna make sure I convey that to you. And it says, Dr. Morris, you definitely succeeded in doing justice to the Black girl stories and push out specifically the documentary uh, that we watched. Can you address how telling and listening to stories can not only be the start of healing for individuals, but how individual stories can lead to systemic change? Thank you. Um, I'm a strong believer in narrative inquiry. <laughs> People make policies. Policies don't make themselves. The data can be compelling if you're building through and working through large, you know, extant databases and you can mine data all day to tell a story. But I think that there are ways of humanizing that story that invite people into um, a feeling of empathy that I hope will also lead to a deeper inquiry into who is impacted by the policies and practices that I'm engaging, that I'm developing, that I support, that I put people in place to support, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that when all is said and done, um, that people also recognize that storytelling is a critical part of how we know, right? There, um, is an extended epistemology that moves beyond just the numbers, right, or the theories, and that invites us into um, understanding a condition through lived experience, through symbols, through storytelling and art, um, you know, through uh, applied engagement that we have to, in our conversation about knowing something, um, honor the extended ways that we know. And so storytelling for me um, and listening, the deep listening and talking to 
girls in this in, in this um, exploration around school pushout is really about inviting us to know differently, inviting us to understand this question differently. Um, and we get that. We, we are exposed to new language. We're exposed to um, new constructs when we have conversations with people and we allow them the freedom to demonstrate for us um, through their shared experience. Um, you know, a way of honoring the place in us that can recognize something in them that is valuable. This is all about humanizing those numbers. People see the numbers and they recognize that Black girls are disproportionately overrepresented, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I recognized early on that people would follow the images of Black girls, little five and six year old Black girls in handcuffs with the wrong question. People would see those images and say, what does she do? oh, she must have done something bad to be in handcuffs, right? Without consideration for the fact that there were deep structures that were criminalizing a five-year-old for having a tantrum in class. Any one of us who has had a five-year-old or worked with a five-year-old um, knows, or been around a five-year-old knows that they can throw a mean tantrum. And we all know that there are ways of intervening and uh, regulating a child you know, without involving law enforcement. It's just a matter of whether we see the children who are living with these, these conditions of, of hyperpunitive criminalizing responses to their moments of dysregulation as acceptable or not. The only way for us to understand and unpack that uh, the assumptions that, um, you know, that are, 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 are leading to some of these conditions and our ex sort of blanket acceptance of these conditions is for them to tell their stories and talk to us about who they are. So my hope is that through these individual stories, people will recognize the pattern. People will recognize the impact of the data of the policy and remember these faces when they see uh, conditions or numbers that feel that they are harmful. Thank you again. I, I was hoping, I know that we're, we're probably getting uh, very close to the end of our time together, which makes me very sad, I would add, because it's been delightful having you here this evening as well. I, I was hoping if, if we could that you might circle back to the idea of the, of uh, kind of the savior mentality that you touched on earlier. I, I s suspect strongly that a lot of very well-meaning people uh, fall into the savior mentality very easily. Uh, is there anything you'd like to elaborate on or add to perhaps uh, avoiding that that tendency or, or channeling in a more constructive direction. Yeah, I, I, I wanna say that many of us have experienced the savior mentality, right? There are various forms of it, <laughs> right? Um, you know, the, you, you know I, I, I think that when people see young people in crisis, it's our inclination to want to protect, which I think is valuable. Um, I think protection is important, nurturing is, is important, Comfort is, is important, which is why all of the, uh, you know, these as elements of adultification are problematic when we don't do these things. Um, it's problematic. And when we don't do them disproportionately to black girls, that's also problematic. Um, the interrogation and, and offering that I have around uh, the savior mentality is really about trying to shift us away from feeling that uh, we have all the answers, that the knowledge um, about what is best for a person is located in us. So many of our systems are designed for the adults to assume they have the answers or to work with other adults to produce um, a plan based upon our um, understanding of ourselves as the keepers of knowledge. And so, you know, the savior can't you know, challenging that requires that we also recognize what agency she has in her own life. Um, we have learned in over, you know, at least a decade of working with girls of color, um, mostly black girls in this space and, and, and longer for some organizations within our network, that it's really important for us to recognize the truths that you know black girls bring to this conversation and that when we center them in their own learning in their own capacity to articulate what they need 
that they, you know, really show up and grow in a way that um, invites for a real deep connection, but also opportunity for their own healing, um, you know, against a series of disruptions in their lives. That's, that's what this is about for me. Um, it's about, you know, the academic interrogations around privilege and the scholarly conversations that we have about, um, you know, dismantling structures and understanding systems and all those things that excite me also. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when we're talking about dismantling structures of oppression that lead to the criminalization of Black girls in schools, what we fundamentally need to do is explore all the ways that we can enhance the agency and protect and nurture the agency and wisdom that these girls have in their own bodies because they are living this experience, the way that they know what conditions are uh, supportive of their learning and the way that they know that some of the conditions are not supportive of their learning and have real conversations with ourselves about how we are using our power then to support their well-being or to be a part of the tapestry of harm in their lives. I hope that we all choose love. I hope that we cho choose to be in a space of being a part of the tapestry of healing. Um, the, the materials that I put out are not rhetorical, <laughs> right? The materials that I put out are not for people to read or see and say, oh, you know, Monique really cares about Black girls, good for her, right? I want this to be about how we show up collectively as a community to address an issue that has been identified and that um, really has a lot of opportunity for us to quickly remedy if we are in community with each other, recognize the nature um, of reciprocity um, in this conversation and explore all the ways that we can increase the capacity of girls to stand in their gifts without reprimand. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm sure that as educators, we appreciate the value of having proper closure to, to anything. Uh, and I, I very much feel that that may be what you just did, uh, but I still would like to ask before we wrap up and conclude, is, is there any anything else you would like to add, anything else you'd like to say this evening to us? Just continue the exploration. Thank you for inviting me. This is one night, right? Um, and so I think it would be really um, imperative for there to be a continuation of conversations and exploration of how this might manifest in your own communities, um, build relationships with organizations that are doing work around these issues in your communities, um, schools that are tackling these issues in your communities. So um, just consider this part of the journey, please, and not uh, the, the event. <laughs> I, I could not agree more and very much hope that this will be the, just the beginning or the catalyst for some great things to come. Thank you again, sincerely, so much for being here tonight. It has been an absolute joy to, to speak with you and to have you uh, in community with us. I'd like to once again take the opportunity, if I may, to thank our, our panelists, the many, many people at Indiana universities to help to make this possible. Of course, everyone who uh, was with us tonight watching this. And I hope that it would be an appropriate way to conclude to, uh, to say emphatically, Black girls are sacred and loved. Thank you. Thank you.